We've made it through January. How are you doing? Are you coping? Are you struggling? Are you, as they say in Irish, are you extrahalt? Struggling. I've had, I, I've had an okay kind of uh, January. Much better than some years. Now that's to do with health, you know, past. Well, the past four or five years, since 2018, if I think January 2019, I was just like, you know, two months, one month through heart attack. And then in 2020, 2021, you're talking Bowmount operations and so each year you're just struggling. And then two years ago, 2022, uh, detached retina, January, going around with one eye. So I have to say, January 2024, very good. <laughs> I hope you're okay, and if you're struggling, if you're, if you've had trouble emotionally, physically, in this month, I hope that the podcast has been a help. It's my little ministry. It's like I'm a storyteller, but the the sharing of stories and sharing of my faith is is something I do with a great relish because I feel. It helps me to do it, and maybe it, maybe it just gives you a good feeling, you know. Feel good. That's. I've always thought that was a good way to live, you know. Like, like rather than having high moral values or, like, moral sounding values when you go into a shop and you meet somebody or when you have a friendship or a relationship or when you're meeting an old relation if you work on just feel good right so i'll make you feel good and you'll make me feel good like that's simple you know it's not rocket science and it it creates in me a kind of good humor even though i'd be in bad humor Another contradiction that I'm always fascinated with that, you know, you have this sense of sometimes darkness, melancholy. I've I've had melancholy all my life. I wrote about it in the Irish Times and Columns from 20, 2006 until nearly last year, 17, 18 years of columns. And regularly talking about that strange sense of sorrow and I remember it as a child. I remember writing it as a child. And to be honest with you, you know that there's loads of different reasons for melancholy, for depression, for for feeling low. And some of them, now that I've had physical difficulties, I realise that there's a possibility that some of the difficulties that I had emotionally, like with melancholy, were actually stemming from physical issues. I know mostly people say, well, your your physical problems come from your mental problems. You know, people say, the body keeps the score. Meaning like, you know, distress in your psyche can come out in your body. Okay, that's true. But there's no point in being too clench-fisted about that as, as the ultimate truth because it does work the other way. Sometimes, especially with older people, I think somebody's in bad humour might be just a, some little infection or some little thing physically that's not right. And it could very likely be that, you know, moments I had of depression in my life as early as, early as when I was in my 20s, they might have just been coming from a huge dysfunctional physical problem I had without knowing it. Anyway, 
I'm sorry I got into that because I just wanted to say I hope that you've been doing well and even if you have had difficulties physically or emotionally, mentally, if you found January difficult, well let me tell you, we're nearly through it. And I think we're nearly we're nearly through to that moment of thinking about spring and, and, and Bridget's day. Oh, that excites me hugely. And what I thought I would do this week was was really kind of conclude and complete the whole month of January with a few stories. I use more shampoo. I use more conditioner. I buy soap in six packs and I've become a 24-7 deodorized dude. I consider shampoo and soap to be the hallmarks of modern Ireland, to be in a state of grace in the 21st century is a tangible thing, it is to be washed. A body just out of the shower exudes an elegance that is as close as urban life gets to a metaphysical condition. Intimacy is a tricky issue in built-up areas. The Internet Café is intimate. I like getting one of the machines at the window and looking out onto the street at the passers-by and at the red bricked houses opposite. There's a Sioux Rider shop nearby and a pub called Zoo Bar. It feels like Coronation Street. I keep expecting to see Jack Duckworth pass on his way to the Rovers. The beautiful young woman beside me was in a fur coat. I presumed there were clothes beneath the fur, but all I could see was her perfect black page-boy head sticking out of what might have been an entire family of dead huskies, and her long manicured fingers trotting across the keyboard beside me in a flurry of stress. Suddenly, she started talking as she typed. Apparently, she was desperate for a haircut. To my eye, she didn't look like she needed a haircut at all. But she certainly felt she did. And whoever she usually went to couldn't do her that morning because she had no appointment, and by now she was livid with rage. I'm not used to people opening up like that in the middle of an internet café, but she was in a serious temper, so I says jokingly that I sometimes suspect that there are more hairdressing salons in Mullingar than in Paris. But you'll not find Mullingar hair salons on the net, says I. Maybe you should try the phone book. She looked at me, as if I was suggesting she go to a barber. The yellow pages, I continued, I'm sure you'll get the full list of Mullingar hair places in the yellow pages. I think she felt that her hair problem was none of my business. I looked at her coat and began thinking that maybe it was real fur. And she stared back at me, as if I might be her next dinner. Finally, it dawned on me that she was not talking to me at all. She was on a Bluetooth link to her mother. I turned my face with what little dignity I could muster to my own screen and googled my own email in silence. When I was in Mongolia years ago, Travelling across the plains with a jeep of monks, 
We only washed whenever we came to a stream, which was not very often, and there was a whiff of every human body in the jeep, which surpassed the worst excesses of a fox. But in the end we got used to it, we got comfortable with it, and we came to accept body odours as something human. And since Mongolia is simply one wide open space, everyone could stand off from everyone else, and in the jeep we kept the windows open. But on my way home from that trip I was deeply embarrassed in the London Underground when I was caught in a sardine-tight squeeze at eight in the morning and all the young women were holding the railings above their heads pure perfume wafting from their hairless armpits, and me standing there trying to avoid doing something similar because I knew my own oxter was singing like a dead yak. I cannot easily forget the resentful look in those ladies' eyes who had to endure me all the way to Leicester Square. Fortunately, the woman in the internet cafe did not hold anything against me. She was much too busy finding a solution to her own personal crisis. In fact, she did find Mullingar hairdressers on the net, and she had secured a new appointment in a few minutes. And then, triumphantly, she blue-tooted a friend called Alice and asked would they meet later for a mocha, if Alice was free at, say, around one-ish. Then she got up and left, leaving just a delicate trace of Chanel in the air as she went out the door. I wrote that as a reflection on how, you know, how the world of the male can be like a bear's cave that he carries around with him. That that there's something about a male's sensuality which is almost offensive to women. That sort of unwashed, smelling, hairy space of flesh which never bothers the man himself. I know it, I'm a man, I could go for weeks when I was young without washing very thoroughly. You get a bit more sensitive as you get older. But it's an amazing thing, when I look back on that reflection now, it's not so much that humour about odour and body odour that amazes me. What amazes me now is how obsolete some of those things are. You know, that was only four, 12 years ago. And I was talking about going into an internet cafe. Are you serious? To use the computer in the cafe to send emails. And I was recommending to this woman that she might look in a thing called the Yellow Pages, which I'm sure nobody of a certain age even knows what it is anymore. And I'm saying to her, you won't get, you won't get the hairdressers on the internet. You'll have to go to the Yellow Pages. Me being like full of common sense. It seems unbelievable now that there was a time when people were not using the internet. They didn't have websites. They didn't have Facebook pages. And it astonishes me how swiftly time has passed in those 12 years when you think about the technology. My, my mother died in 2012. I had a great friend in college, John O'Donoghue, the famous 
John O'Donoghue. We had grown apart for many years when he passed away suddenly, but somebody reminded me there three or four days ago that it was around this week, 17 years ago, that the wonderful, beautiful John O'Donoghue passed away. He lives forever in his writing. He lives forever, I believe, in heaven. May he rest easy. Twelve years ago my mother died, as I say, but I wrote a little thing at the time about my granny. I knew my granny was not fully in tune with the modern world because when we went to knock, she sat in the back of the car with her hat on for the entire journey and when we went over a small humped bridge somewhere in Roscommon she hit the roof and squashed the hat and she was so terrified that my father had to stop the car. I'd travel better in a pony and trap, she joked. But my father explained with some irritation that only a car could get us to knock. So she got out her rosary beads and prayed all the way to the shrine, a place where the Mother of God appeared eighty years earlier and where Granny seemed more at peace than in the ordinary world. But when John, Pope John the Twenty Third, appeared on our Pi Continental television set, I suspected that she might find it all a little confusing. I was eight years of age, but much more sophisticated than Granny because I had been watching BBC for years. To me, Grandstand, for the sports on a Saturday afternoon, followed by The Lone Ranger, and Bill and Ben, the flowerpot men, they were old hat to me, and the Pope on the new Irish channel wasn't going to rock my boat that much. Of course, I didn't realise that the Lone Ranger, with dainty gloves and white hat, sniffing the ground for information, was an actor. I just knew that the moving figures on the grainy screen were images of something happening elsewhere, unrelated to me. That's what Granny never quite got. When she came out one morning to watch the opening of the Second Vatican Council on our television, she knelt down and prayed in our dining room, as if the hand blessing her from the screen, the Pope's hand, as if it was truly in the room. And I have to say I too was impressed. I never knew there were so many bishops in the world with such fancy hats and headdresses. There was an amazing amount of them. Headdresses as elaborate as the pelmets for curtains. Some of them had long beards and looked lean and mean, which put me off because Granny was fat and happy. But who was the Pope? That's what I didn't know, and yet Granny had all the facts. He's the same age as myself, she explained. God bless him. What startled me when I got the first glimpse of him, being carried high in the air on an enormous chair, was that he actually looked like Granny. Granny was sitting on a hard chair by the dining table, moving her beads through fat fingers, and there on the screen was himself, waving at her. I looked from one to the other and could not resist the idea that they were one and the same person. It confused me greatly to think that Granny was opening the Second Vatican Council. Of course, I always knew she was a magical woman who sugared slices of bread for me after school and who spent her days in a dark kitchen 
where it was hard to distinguish where the shadows ended and Granny began. But now she had surpassed herself in magic, because there she was on the television, waving at the world with a peasant's ironic smile. When they carried the Pope on his chair, he rocked, just like I imagined Granny might, behind her pony in the black trap long ago, before cars were invented. And reading from a sheaf of papers, the Pope wore round spectacles like Granny always did when she read the anglo celt I intimated my confusion to my father when we had returned Granny to her shadowy kitchen later in the day, but he chastised me for the thought. It's extremely bold to say that the Pope looks like Granny, he said. And in that moment my world was changed and Granny was forever diminished. I mean, I would have thought he'd say it's extremely bold to say that Granny looks like the Pope. But he was saying it was more insulting to the Pope to say he looked like Granny. So, I realised the Pope was an important person. There was something less in Granny. The world had been enlarged by the television set and her poor world of sugary bread seemed very small by comparison. From that day onwards, I lived a diminished life, in a parochial way, because I could no longer ignore that there was a larger world out there that made both me and Granny insignificant. And yet even to this day, I sometimes sneak onto YouTube and watch the bobbing figure above the helmeted heads of the Swiss guards and the smiling face behind the round spectacles and somewhere inside me I know it is Granny's calm face and fat nose and lovely sensual lips that smile back at me eternally. Yeah, well, (laughs) I suppose in that I was initially thinking again of the way that, you know, technology changes. And it changed so fast in the time of my granny. So she grew up in a pony and trap as her normal way of moving sometimes from the train station to her home. She'd go to the train station when she went to when she wanted to go to Castle Pollard near Mullingar and she'd get the train to any junction in Westmead and then she, somebody would send out a trap eight, ten miles from Castle Pollard and pick her up. And that's the way people travelled. And she would go in the summertime on the train again to Bondorn. So the train would take her as far as Ballyshannon. And in Ballyshannon, she'd get the pony and trap, a hackney pony and trap, to take her into Bundorn. She'd have the children with her, which was my mother, her four four brothers and three sisters. And they'd go on their holidays to Bundorn. And Bundorn is still there. And I walk round Rogie in Bundorn. It's a cliff walk. Very, very, very beautiful. You're looking into the whole bay and you can see Schlie of League cross, <coughs> across way on the other side. It's magnificent. And it's lovely surf and big waves. And I walk there and I touch rocks. It's so astonishing to feel they're there as my grandmother was walking round exactly the same fat pat a hundred years ago. And to think of how the world was 
in such a recent time and how it changed in her lifetime, particularly in the 1960s. When she was in her 70s, when she was getting old, and she had to cope with the television that was, was so hard for people of her age who had never, ever seen a television, so, so difficult to cope with. And yet we can't conceive of a world before television. We can't imagine what it would be like. And then you think that in our lifetime, things have moved on even further. And more dramatically, the acceleration in modernity, in technology, and in the conceptual way that we look at the world, has evolved more rapidly in the past 20 years than it ever did in the previous, probably, 2,000 years. That's, that's frightening. But it's also, I think, a little bit recon consoling. I'll tell you why. Because, you know, at the moment, and particularly since COVID, there seems to be, in the West, a huge amount of disturbance, a huge amount of anger, a huge amount of political upheaval, a huge amount of, you know, ways that technology and science and advances in in culture are challenging people and forcing people into what they call culture wars. Uh, like, like there are things, there are a huge amount of things being questioned and challenged and it's it can be very distressing for people and and there's twitter and and there's so many angry people there and there's so many angry people even even the news on the television like it seems to be like the the west the culture we live in is in turmoil and then all around us there are wars wars that we would have never imagined happening again the Middle East, the Ukraine. So, so it's a really fragile time for young people growing up. And I think that that's, that's really what I take out of that now. When I look back on the kind of stories I, I told and stories I reflected on only 12 years ago, talking about being in a cafe, a, an internet cafe, seems like so archaic, so ancient. And I go back just another generation and I see in the 60s my granny watching television, a human being, me as a child even genuinely thinking, that's granny on the television. I hadn't conceived, conceptualised what exactly is going on in the technology of the television. So it's like, it's like time moves but the pace of change has accelerated. So we experience now generational change, which in the 19th century would have been like, you know, take 80 years for a certain cultural shift to happen. Now it's happening in eight months. And everywhere I'm listening to people talking about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence which is going to further exasperate this situation and leave us ferociously confused. Well, for me then it's it's important to share stories that transcend the actual time, cultural moment because they're just stories about being human. And I find it consoling to to think about being human, that, that that doesn't change. Being lonely, being depressed, saying your prayers, falling in love, being hungry physically, being tired emotionally, craving for food or craving for sexual intimacy or craving for just one hug. It seems to me that, that those things are unchanging in the time of my grandmother, 
in the time of her grandmother in my time and that gives me a huge consolation when I think about young people because I have I have a huge confidence that no matter how the culture changes no matter how we constantly renew and transform the social way that we live no matter how many wars there are no matter how much confusion there is based on new technology I feel confident that there are aspects of being human that are unchanged for generations and will remain unchanged my granny sitting in the back of the car going to knock and being nervous of even being in the car she is the same woman with the same fragilities, the same insecurities, the same sense of prayer in her heart. She is the same as some young child who was born yesterday. There's something enduring about being human. That in every iteration of culture, even though it looks different on the surface, underneath what's happening in the human heart is still unchanging. The way we are embodied as human beings, the way we embody love for each other is like a diamond and it doesn't change. Even though the trappings, the what's around it may change. But what is in us, in the heart, is unchanged since the time of Jesus. And that's what I think. And I'll finish off with um, one other little memory I have, a little reflection from 2011. These are all reflections I've had for January in, in those various years but there was one January it must have been very bad weather there was one winter there I think it was 2011 and it snowed a lot it was a shocking snow it was the worst snow since about 1980 I think 1981 and I remember that one as well being stranded in Maynooth uh, for about a week in the snow but the more recent one in 2011 I was thinking of of a great writer called Pushkin and he lived in St. Petersburg now I used to go to Warsaw and I'd go to write books in Warsaw because I'd get six weeks in Warsaw during the winter and it'd be snow and I used to love January in Warsaw I don't go now. And most of the time they don't even have snow in Warsaw. But I'll read you this little reflection. My grandfather was a priest, the Russian woman said, and then she poured me a brandy. We were having dinner to celebrate the Orthodox Christmas. The dining room walls were white, and the curtains were white, and the Christmas tree was white, and there were blue lights on the tree. I said, Pushkin was shot in the snow. She said, Would you like to go to St. Petersburg? I said, I'd love to. I think Russian writers are very spiritual. Then she poured me another brandy. I said, A theatre director once asked me to write a programme note. When I sent him copy, he said he couldn't use it because I had written that the work of theatre was to make the invisible visible. I even compared his actors to monks. But since I don't speak Russian, and her English was not wonderful, 
I fear a lot of meaning was lost between the two languages. What is your point? she wondered. My point is that we Irish have lost our sense of the sacred, I concluded. We need you Russians to invigorate us again. You are absolutely correct, she said, as she refreshed my glass with brandy once again. In St. Petersburg, she continued, we believe in Father Frost, and he was invisible, although he came in Christmas night with his granddaughter, and they always dressed in blue. Stuffed sea bass, Russian salads, and herrings wrapped in potato, onion, and beetroot were spread on the table as she poured another brandy. This, she said, is called heron in a fur coat, pointing at the dish. What a wonderful image, I declared, a heron in a fur coat. Dermot Healy would relish that. A heron, like like the bird, you know, that's what I heard her saying. A heron in a fur coat. No, no, she said, no, not heron, herring. It's called herring in a fur coat. I said, well, it's delicious. She said, who is Dermot Healy? And she reached again for the brandy. I said, he's a magnificent poet who lives in Sligo, and when the geese come from Greenland and fly over his house, he waves at them. He sounds Russian, she said. He sounds like Tolstoy. I said, he looks like Tolstoy. Now, we will have goose for main course, she decided, and so we did. But we didn't have music, which was a pity, just more brandy. I told her that I always have music with dinner. I have an old-fashioned amplifier and enormous speakers, which I bought in Enniskillen in 1981, the year of the hunger strikes. Back then, I needed BBC Radio 3 to cheer me up when the Republicans and the Unionists were locked into their tedious argument about whether a boiled egg should be opened at the little end or the big end. Ah, she said, Now you sound like Tolstoy. There was a fluffy penguin with suitcases and red sunglasses sitting on the television set. He looked like he might be going on his holidays to the Canary Islands. Fortunately, the Russian woman was going nowhere because she opened another bottle of Napoleon cognac and I lay on the couch and she tidied away the dishes. And then I noticed more fluffy penguins on the sofa, wearing sunglasses and black berries, as if they were IRA men going home after a good bank robbery. I asked her, did she see many penguins in Russia? Only in zoo, she replied. And then she had one glass for the road, though neither we nor the penguins intended moving. When I mentioned the recession, she said that Irish people reminded her of donkeys in Uzbekistan. How will the problem be solved, she wondered, meaning the recession. I suggested that Ireland should introduce legislation to make all people over 75 legally dead. An act of Parliament would do the trick. The savings on pensions and health care would be enormous. Properties would be passed on to needy children 
and an eloquent amendment could be added to the Constitution, protecting the life of both the unborn and the undead. I'd had a lot of brandy by now. Of course, those over 75 would still wander around public parks, like ducks, and a small fund might be set aside for feeding them. But by and large, this single proposal would solve the entire financial debt crisis. And then we had another brandy, and she declared that she was going to disappear which she did instantly, down a corridor and into her room, where she slept in a bed that cost two and a half thousand euros. At least that's what she told me. But I remained on the couch, and in the morning she reappeared, made a remarkably fine soup for breakfast, and I had, thankfully, only the slightest hint of a hangover. Well, it was such a wonderful night. The 6th of January, her Christmas Eve, 12 years ago. No? Yeah, 12 years ago. And such a wonderful night of fish, and and those kind of cold vegetables that are marinated and brandy and more brandy and when I look back on it I think God I was able I was able for it you know one of the saddest things I I have to say about growing old is I can drink less maybe that's one of the good things about growing old but I do miss the wildness of, you know, talking rubbish into the middle of the night and drinking endless brandies and one better than the next. And how the conversations become surreal when you're drinking. And your imagination takes off in all sorts of strange directions. But I could do it, you know, it's sad to think of the war now. And I'm heartbroken every time I watch uh, the St. Elizabeth Convent liturgies, which I find on YouTube. St. Elizabeth Convent Minsk liturgy. And there I get the divine service and um, various kind of prayer sessions. They're so beautiful and I was there once, and so I I remember, you know, when I'm watching the television, it's like I'm remembering being there. And I always thought I'd go back, but the war, even though Minsk is in Belarus, it's not in Russia, but the politics of the world now in that area of Europe, I wouldn't be inclined to go back now. And it's so sad, it's so sad because, you know, there was a a wonderful Russian friend who's still a dear friend of mine and we still are very close. But there's ways that the wars get between people. And all I can say is that, again, the way we've got older now, it's another way that you change. So it's like, it's like thinking about my granny when she was young and she was in Bondorn and then thinking about my granny as an old woman going to knock, not being used to the car, watching the television, being amazed with the Pope and me watching the Pope at the time because I was young full and thinking like, God, he looks like granny. Maybe he is granny. And then me going on in life and I'm sitting there thinking I'm so modern. I'm full of modernity, sitting in a cafe in Mullingar, talking to a lady beside me who I don't realise is talking to somebody on the phone. And I'm telling her, oh, you should be using the yellow pages. And not realising that every minute, every day, technology is sweeping, sweeping ahead, 
and transforming culture. And now I'm old and I can't drink as much brandy and it's the end of January and I've been off it. A dry January I've been on. Just to gather me emotions and get a bit of health and go out walking and I'm doing all that. It keeps me from being depressed. It's really good. I've had a great January. And what I, what I get from all those reflections is the sense that underneath the changes, the changes of age from being a young man to being an old man, the changes from the time where you're, you're with friends and you love them and then people pass away and you're lonely and bereaved, the times the way they change with culture wars, with explosions of of new technology and artificial intelligence and like you can't keep up with what's going on on the internet. And yet through it all, through it all, I have this sense that there is one thing unchanged, one thing that never changes from the time of the Buddha, the time of Christ, the time of Pushkin, the time of my childhood, my grandmother's childhood, the one thing that never changes is love. To say, I love you, when the heart opens up to the beloved, when you're with your child, your mother, your father, a friend, when you experience a hug as, as the fulfillment of longing, the hug you needed, and then you find it. When you share your loneliness with other people and and by sharing your loneliness you find that that you're close to them, that you share your story. You blend your story with theirs and it becomes our story, our story. This is how we are human. And, and that remains the same all the time. And it's the same in different seasons it's the same in winter and the same in spring. And that's where I leave you at this moment at the end of January. Looking forward to sharing February with you. And March. St. Bridget's Day and then onwards to the equinox. How beautiful it is to be alive when you have this sense of love in your heart that liberates you from all history, all anxiety, all worry. Allows you to live in the present moment as a kind of a continuous eternity. Not the changing surface of time, but the continuous eternity. That's where you are right now. And thank you for being here. Bye-bye.